it's really happening. Starship is ready. The FAA has finally issued a launch license. In less than two days, SpaceX will be sending the largest and most powerful rocket ever made into space. Or at least they will try. Rocket flight testing is an essential part of the development process for any space launch vehicle. It allows engineers to collect valuable data on the performance of the rocket and its components during flight, ensuring that the vehicle is ready to perform optimally during its intended missions. One of the most anticipated aspects of a rocket flight test are its milestones, which mark the successful completion of critical events during the flight. Every detail from fueling to the final countdown must be carefully executed to ensure a successful mission. In this video we will take a closer look at both the approximate pre-launch timeline and also the post-launch timeline. We'll go over each event and learn a little bit about what we can expect from them. Beginning at two hours before liftoff, the SpaceX flight director conducts a poll to verify that all systems are ready for propellant loading. This crucial step ensures that all necessary pre-launch preparations are complete and that the rocket is in a suitable condition for fueling. With a go-ahead from the flight director, the loading of liquid oxygen into the booster begins at 1 hour and 39 minutes before launch. Simultaneously with the loading of liquid oxygen, liquid methane is also loaded into the rocket. Methane serves as the fuel in SpaceX's Raptor engines, which combined with oxygen provides the energy necessary to propel the rocket into space. At 1 hour and 22 minutes before launch, the loading of liquid methane into the upper stage, aka Starship, begins. Like the booster, Starship relies on liquid methane as its fuel source. Five minutes after the start of fuel loading into the ship, liquid oxygen will also start being loaded. As the countdown nears its final minutes, the Raptor engines on the booster undergo a chilling process at around 17 minutes before launch. This procedure cools down the engines, preparing them for the intense pressure with which the cryogenic propellant will come out of the turbo pumps, thus preventing any thermal shock that could occur given the extremely low temperatures of said propellant. At 40 seconds before launch, the fluid interfaces within the rocket begin their vent down sequence. This process ensures that all fluid lines and systems are properly vented and depressurized before liftoff. With just 8 seconds left on the countdown, the Raptor engine's startup sequence begins. This is when the engines begin to ignite, which will then basically become the captain. As the countdown reaches zero, if the engines are producing enough thrust to lift this behemoth of a rocket off the ground, the clamps holding down the rocket inside the launch table will open and finally unleash the beast. Now, as is the case for every rocket launch, there is a series of milestones to be completed. And even though SpaceX has given us a detailed list of each and every milestone for the flight of Starship, they have also made clear that the completion of these milestones is not required for this first launch attempt to be labeled as successful, not even reaching max Q seems to be required. And I think this has to do with the fact that the main goal is for Starship to clear the launch pad, to lift off and not explode while still sitting on the launch mount. And if it does have to explode, then that explosion should happen as far away from the launch pad as possible. And this makes total sense, since building and constructing the Stage Zero has by far been the costliest and most complex part of the whole Starship program. The spacecraft itself is replaceable, there are more starships waiting in line to take their turn and go to space, and even more ships as well as boosters are being built at lightning speed. However, no stage zeros or launch pads are waiting in line, nor can they be built as quickly as a starship prototype. So it seems sensible that the main goal for this first test flight is for starship to lift off the ground without causing any major damage, with the completion of any further milestones being seen as a perk. That being said, SpaceX engineers have a remarkable track record of being really good at what they do, and so I am confident that we will see starship at least going past Max-Q. So now let's continue with the post-launch milestones. The first, or should I say the second significant milestone for the first test flight of Starship is Max-Q, or the moment of peak mechanical stress on the rocket. Occurring approximately 55 seconds after liftoff, 
Max Q is the point at which the combination of the rocket's velocity and the density of Earth's atmosphere creates the highest aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Successfully passing through Max Q demonstrates that the rocket's structural design is capable of withstanding the intense forces it will encounter during ascent. At approximately 2 minutes and 49 seconds into the flight, the booster main engine cutoff, or MICO, takes place. This is the moment when the first stage of the rocket, in this case Super Heavy Booster, shuts down its engines after being close to depleting its propellant supply. This shutdown is a critical event as it indicates that the rocket has successfully generated enough velocity and altitude to progress to the next stage of the flight. Just 3 seconds after Miko, the stage separation occurs. This is the process by which the first stage of the rocket, that is the booster, is detached from the upper stage allowing the latter to continue its journey into space. Stage separation is a complex and precisely timed event, and we've seen multiple times whenever a new rocket is tested that this is a pain point that isn't resolved that easily. So, crossing my fingers for Starship, approximately 5 seconds after stage separation, the upper stage of the rocket, in this case Starship, ignites its engines. This marks the beginning of the final push towards the intended orbit, or in this case, altitude. This milestone will be crucial to the overall success of future missions, as it showcases the performance of the spacecraft and its ability to deliver payloads to their intended destinations. At around 3 minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, the booster begins its boostback burn, which is also a crucial maneuver to reverse its trajectory and set it on course for a landing on Earth. This burn involves reigniting the booster's engines to slow down its forward momentum and change its direction. A successful boostback burn startup signifies the booster's ability to perform complex maneuvers and navigate back to Earth. If we get this far into the launch attempt, I am confident that we could see a controlled booster landing in the ocean. After all, SpaceX has been landing orbital class rockets with more precision than I can drink my coffee for years now, so it should be doable. In this case, and possibly the next two flights, according to the FAA, it will be a splashdown in the ocean, and in the future it will be a controlled catch or leaning onto the catching arms of the launch tower. A successful landing burn indicates that the booster has sufficient fuel reserves and accurate guidance systems to ensure a safe and controlled landing. According to the FAA for this first flight, the plan is for Super Heavy to impact the water intact vertically, then within several seconds Super Heavy would tip over and impact the water horizontally. The structural capabilities of both propellant tanks should prevent Super Heavy from undergoing any rapid unscheduled disassembly and thus remain intact. Then the booster will be sunk by opening its tank vents and allowing the water to rush in. Should this method not work, other options would be to use a vessel and tow line to roll over the booster and orientate it in such a manner that would allow water to flow in through the vents. And if that also doesn't work, then firearms may be used to shoot holes into it. Approximately 9 minutes and 20 seconds into the flight, the Starship's engines shut down. This engine cutoff signifies that the Starship has reached its desired orbit or trajectory and no longer needs propulsion. This is also an important milestone as it confirms the Starship's ability to reach its intended destination. Following engine cutoff, Starship will vent residual main tank propellant during its in-space coast phase at or above 120 km, though it won't be vented down to the last drop of propellant since some of it, approximately 10 metric tons of liquid oxygen and 4 metric tons of methane will remain in the spacecraft to serve as ballast in order to successfully maintain trajectory to the landing location. After this, Starship will coast above the Earth for a bit over an hour until about 1 hour and 17 minutes when the Starship begins its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. This phase is critical as it involves the spacecraft slowing down and dissipating the heat generated by its interaction with the atmosphere. This is the milestone which I am the least confident about because I still have doubts concerning the robustness of the thermal protection system. We will see what happens, but I almost expect Starship to break up during this re-entry. At around 1 hour and 22 minutes into the flight, if Starship makes it through re-entry, it will reach the transonic phase. Similar to the booster, this phase involves transitioning from supersonic to subsonic speeds and requires 
careful control and stability. Around 1.5 years ago, we saw that Starship is already capable of remaining stable during descent, at least at lower speeds, so I expect this phase to also be a success, if it makes it through the upper parts of the atmosphere, that is. Finally, at approximately 1 hour and 30 minutes into the flight, the Starship will complete its mission with a horizontal splashdown into the Pacific Ocean near Hawaii. Its high velocity will drive structural failure of the vehicle upon impact, allowing the remaining liquid oxygen methane to mix, resulting in an explosive event. Following the breakup of the vehicle, SpaceX will send a vessel to the area with the highest likelihood of debris being present and which would then identify large debris for salvage. Many seem to be surprised that Starship won't attempt a soft water landing as is the case with the booster, me included. As a matter of fact, they will not be attempting a soft water landing for the next two flights either. Why is this the case? I don't know. If you have any idea, please let me know in the comment section down below. I will also drop a link to the FAA's documentation about the upcoming Starship flights so that you can read them in detail. It's 122 pages, so you will need patience. So that's pretty much it for this video. I will see you all after the launch. Good luck SpaceX. Thanks for watching. See you soon.